We're going to be in Isaiah 53 today, if you have your Bibles, a text we've been working through in this series. And as I've told you before, for those of you who maybe haven't been with us for the entirety of our series, this text was written some 700 years before Jesus was born. The title of our series is, What are the Odds? And we've looked a lot um, at, at what are the odds that Jesus could fulfill the 300 plus prophecies that are are spoken of him in the Old Testament. Last week we took a lot of time to unpack what those odds actually are, and I'll just cut to the chase. We don't have time to unpack it all today, but the reality is those odds are pretty much impossible, that one person could fulfill all of those things unless that one person was indeed the Messiah, the Son of God. So today we approach Isaiah 53 and we will once again see just how amazing our Savior is and what he has done for us. Before we do that though, I wanted to invite a couple of my friends on stage with me this morning to to give a, a quick testimony to you. Is that okay? Is it okay if we have a little testimony on Easter morning? All right, y'all come on out here, ladies. Come on up here to the front. I want everybody to see you. So um, this is Jenny, and this is Melina. You'll meet her in just a moment. I've invited them on stage because they have both gone through something that's incredibly tough. Um, Different kinds of things that are tough, as you'll hear about in a second. Uh, But I, I think it's a good representation of God's faithfulness as we see the things God has brought them through. And uh, also, as you can tell, there's just a little bit of an age difference uh, between the two of them. Just a little, Jenny. It's not much. You know, it's okay. Uh, Yeah, yeah, it's just just a couple of decades. But uh, (laughs) it's all right. Not quite a century, but a couple decades. And, uh, (laughs) And I think that shows us that God is always moving, right? He's always with us. It doesn't matter what stage in life we're in. And so there's a lot of people we could have brought up here during this time, but I I wanted these two ladies as I prayed about it. I just thought it would be good. So let me tell you a little bit about Jenny's story. Neither one of them are really talkers. They're not real excited about being up here. So (laughs) let me tell you just a little bit about their their story. So Jenny, um, a little over 10 years ago, was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And if you know anything about pancreatic cancer, um, that is the cancer you do not want to hear you have. Because if you hear you have pancreatic cancer, the odds are not good. You have much hope of of living uh, very long. I remember when Jenny told me uh, that she had it. We were right back there in the back of the church on a Sunday morning after service. And we prayed together that morning. And she knew what the odds were. She had been told by the doctors that pancreatic cancer is not good. And they had had essentially told her, we're going to do what we can for you. But ultimately, if you're going to get better, it's, you know, we can't do it. There, it's going to have to be the hand of God in your life. And we prayed uh, that morning that God would do that. Fast forward uh, a little bit. Jenny had an experimental um, surgery, if you will, where they went in and uh, wanted to see what they could do, an exploratory kind of experimental deal. And they went in, they took out part of her pancreas. And she had to go through chemo and radiation and all sorts of things after that. But um, I I want, Jenny, would you just tell us um, how you felt going into the surgery and then how you felt coming out of the surgery? Going into the surgery, I was just praying that they were wrong and that it wasn't cancer. But eight days later in ICU, When I woke up, I found that it was, and I did go through chemo and radiation, but I did believe that I was going to die. Yeah, so she had the surgery, and then that that was pretty tough. Um, She was in ICU for over a week and um, was was out, and you had the tubes and everything else. You remember when you woke up, just how that felt? I couldn't speak because... Mm -hmm. Well, if you've ever had those down your throat, you, you know. Yeah, it was a hard time. So, but ultimately, what did God do? He saved my life. Yeah. And ultimately, after a few months, I believed after a few months. Now, I did a lot of Bible reading, did a lot of praying, earnest praying, but I really then changed something 
changed in me, and I really believe that God was going to save my life, and he did. Yeah. And this January, it's been 10 years. January 27, 2013 is when I had that yeah. surgery. Amen. Amen. So God is good. Let's pass the microphone off to my friend Melina here. She uh, had, a, had a different kind of a situation, but, but similar uh, she was riding a horse and uh, had a horse riding accident not long ago. What was the name of that horse? His name was Einstein. His name was Einstein. But as we discovered in the first service, not because he's a smart horse. Why did you name him Einstein? Because when he was younger, he, his hair used to be up. He had poofy hair? Yes. Okay, so he got the name Einstein. Yes. So you were riding Einstein one evening, and then what happened? So something spooked him. And, and he took off. Yeah, and then what? And then he bucked me off near a lamppost, and I, and I hit my head. Yeah, you hit your head pretty hard. Yes. What do you remember after that? Uh, nothing. Nothing. You don't even remember the helicopter ride? No. Yeah, you don't remember anything? No. So she got to the hospital in San Antonio. Um, her aunt was the one who notified me. But it happened, as you can imagine, mom and dad were pretty busy, um, but things were not good, and the odds were against her. I think we have a picture. Maybe they've already put it up. She was in ICU as well, and it was really touch and go there for a while. And here she is today, just a couple months later, still going through rehab, still working on things, but what did God do for you? He saved my life. Yeah, saved your life, made you better. So... Great testimonies. So, again, I just wanted to bring these ladies up here just as living, breathing testimonies of God's goodness and his faithfulness to us and uh, goes right along with what we're studying this morning. So let's give them another round of applause. Thank you, ladies, so much. Boy, they did good. They were kind of nervous about that, but, uh, man, they did a good job. Turn with me now to Isaiah 53. We're going to be in 4 through 6 today, picking up where we left off Friday night. Here's what our text says. Yet he himself bore our sicknesses, and he carried our pains. But we in turn regarded him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced because of our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities, Punishment for our peace was on him, and we are healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep. We all have turned to our own way, and the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. The big idea, the thing I want you to gather, the thing I want you to remember today is this. Every rebel needs a redeemer. Every rebel needs a redeemer. As we approach this high and holy text, it's important that everyone understands one thing. There are only two options for us on this side of heaven. You are either lost in your rebellion or you have been saved by your redeemer. There's no middle ground. There's no in between. There are no other options. You're either lost in your rebellion or you have already been saved by your redeemer. Again, our text was written some 700 years before Jesus was born, but boy, does Isaiah give us four powerful things to consider when it comes to who Christ is and how he intercedes for us rebels as our Redeemer. The first one is this. We see inside of this text the provision of his presence. The provision of the presence of God in our life. Four, verse 4 brings it to life for us. Our Redeemer, our Savior, our Messiah. He is not a faraway God. He is not an obscure Savior. He's not a Savior who is detached from us or our pain or our troubles or our trials. He is not withdrawn or aloof or, or just not involved with us in any way, shape, or form. No, it is indeed His very presence that produces all of the provision that is needed for us to carry on in this world that is dominated by sin. Isaiah said this in verse 4, yet he himself 
bore our sicknesses, and he carried our pains. You heard that testimony just a few moments ago about the provision that God provides. And I know some of you probably thought a very natural thought when you heard those testimonies. You might have thought, yeah, but what about everybody else I know who wasn't healed? What about all the other people I know that have had pancreatic cancer or some other form of cancer that went on to be with the Lord? Or what about the other people I know that spent time in ICU that didn't get to walk out of the hospital? Can I just tell you that the provision of God's present is not contingent or dependent on us getting better? The provision of God's presence is always there with us because of who he is. He's not just present with us when we see the manifestation of that come about in our getting well. He's present with us always. He never leaves us or forsakes us. Just this Friday, I went around to as many as I could, and I apologize if you're out there and I didn't get to your house, but I went around to as many as I could, visiting those who are homebound, who are sick, that I knew couldn't be with us Friday night to take communion. And I took communion with me and went around and and did communion with people. And one of those houses that I went to, there was a lady who's a member of our church, has been faithful in our church for close to two decades now, who has pancreatic cancer. And it is very clear that God's plan for her is much different than his plan for Jenny was. I I can't explain why. I don't know why. But I do know that his provision for her is just the same as it was for Jenny. Jenny. She has likely taken her last communion, her last Lord's Supper. Her days are drawing short. But even as we spoke together, she talked over and over and over again about how faithful God has been to her throughout her life and how faithful he's been to her through her trials over the last few months with this disease. After we were done praying and visiting, I went outside. We were standing in the garage. I was standing there with her husband. We were watching it rain, and again, he was so quick to talk about how faithful God has been and all these little blessings that God has brought their way and how God has been with them every step of the way. And he didn't know anything about my sermon or my text or anything. He just could not help but talk about the goodness of God even in the midst of this incredibly painful time in their life. This is what I call the provision of His presence. His presence is the provision that we need. The pronoun here in the Hebrew is emphatic. It's emphasized by the writer for the single purpose of reminding us, the reader, that he is with us. One commentator wrote, The Savior's sorrows are related to our sorrows. He is connected to us. He knows our pain." He understands our struggles and our temptations. He's felt our sorrow. He too has wept at the graveside. He's battled temptations that came directly from the devil himself. We read about it in scripture. He is in a very real and a very active way connected to us in our pain. And he is concerned for us, all of us. He is connected to and concerned for both the rebel, and the righteous. Matthew connects us to this idea from the perspective of the physical in Matthew chapter 8. In Matthew 8, 14 through 17, it says this, Jesus went into Peter's house and he saw his mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. So he touched her hand. I don't think Peter had much to do with that. My mother-in-law's here today. I'm not talking about my Mimi. That's not what we're talking about here. But, yeah, I know I'm, I've heard about y'all's mother-in-laws. And I, I don't see here that G- Jesus asked any permission from Peter. If he would have, Peter might have said, don't be touching her. But he touched her. He touched her hand, and what happened? The fever left her. And she got up, and she got better. Whether Peter liked that or not, we don't know. But when evening came, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he drove out the spirits with the word, and he healed those who were sick. So that what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. 
that he himself took our weaknesses and he carried our diseases. When you have the presence of Christ in your life, you possess all of the provisions you will ever need for life. So my question is this, are you in possession of this provision? Is the presence of Christ at work in your life? We read this in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Is that your testimony? He goes on and says, the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God. Is that your testimony? The Son of God who loved me, he says, and gave himself for me. Is that your testimony? Does Christ live in you? Do you live by faith in the Son of God? The Savior who loved you and gave himself for you, do you know him? Is the provision of his holy presence alive inside of your life? We see the provision of his presence predicted in our text. But look at the last part of verse 4. What do we do with this provision? It says, yet he himself bore our sicknesses and he carried our pains. But what did we do? But we, in turn, regarded him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. Why? Why? Why do we do this? I'll tell you why. Because we're rebels. That's why. And that's why I'm here today to tell you every rebel needs a redeemer. Don't resist the Redeemer. Don't regard your Savior as stricken. Embrace the reality of His provision, which is only found in His presence. Is He alive inside of you? Every rebel needs a Redeemer. 700 years before Christ was born, we also see here in this text what I call the perspective of our position. And it's not a good perspective, by the way. Our position is not a good position, but we see it here in verses 5 and 6. This perspective that Isaiah brings to life, it's interwoven with our next point. But look at this, look at our position. It says, but he was pierced because of our rebellion. That's our position, we're rebels. He was crushed because of our iniquities. That's our position. Punished for our peace was on him. And we are healed by his wounds. Look at verse 6. We all went astray. This is our position. We all went astray like sheep. We all have turned to our own way. And the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. Isaiah penned this perspective here about the condition of the human heart and the soul of mankind. He penned a perspective that most want to forget exists that many want to ignore. A perspective that says we are sinners, we are rebellious, we are disobedient, we have all gone astray. The writer of Ecclesiastes noticed, noted this uh, dreadful condition in the human heart in Ecclesiastes 7.20. He said, there is certainly no one righteous on the earth who does good and never sins. No one. He understood that from a spiritual perspective, we're all rebels. That's the default position, but there are still many. In fact, there are billions of people right now that think their sin is not a problem, that their sin is not an issue. Just yesterday, I went, I put this on Facebook yesterday, I went and donated blood, something I do every eight to ten weeks whenever I'm eligible. And I went, and yesterday was different, and I wasn't expecting this, by the way. I I thought with it being a holiday weekend, the place would be packed, but when I got there, there was nobody there. I walked in, and all the employees were sitting there just waiting for somebody to come in, and I was the somebody. So I went in, I did the little thing in the room, I answered the, you know, 150 questions they make you answer, and did all the stuff, and then I went and sat down in the chair, and because I was the only one there, I thought, you know what, I'm going to really get to share Jesus with these ladies today. Because usually they're so busy, you know, they just stick you and get the pump pumping and then boom, they're gone. They leave you there. But they had nowhere to go because the last thing they always tell you is if you need anything else, my name is, just give me a call. And so I just kept calling their name because they had nothing else to do. So we were sitting there and we were talking and um, I found out that none of them went to church. None of them had a church home. None of them 
uh, seemed to be believers from what I could tell. And so I started trying to just share the love of God with them and, and share a little bit about the gospel. And one of the ladies, they kept trying to change the, the, you know, the subject. They wanted to talk about anything but that. And, and one of the ladies, she finally, she said to me, she said, well, tell us why you come in here. Tell us why you do this. Why do you give blood? What is, how does this make you feel? I said, oh, I mean, I'll tell you why I do it. I mean, I want to do it to help people, just like anybody would, I guess. I said, because I know that, that giving this blood can help somebody, somebody like Melina maybe, or somebody like Jenny who's going through surgery, right? It, it, it's a help. I said, but here's the thing. My blood can only help somebody temporarily. At best, it just prolongs their life a little bit. But I said, you know, the blood of Jesus it fixes people eternally. I just kept doing that. I just kept bringing it back to Jesus. Kept inviting them to church and all that. Maybe they're here today. I don't know. But um, I just kept saying that. And then, then one of the ladies, one of the other ladies, she said, uh, she spoke up from kind of across the way. And she said, you know, I, there's lots of religions. There's lots of, of, of people that say they know the way to heaven. There's, you know, a lot of religions in the world. And I said, you're right. There are. There's thousands of religions in the world. I said, but there's only one empty tomb. One out of all the religions. There's only one savior who walked out of the tomb. We got something ain't nobody else got. Jesus. It's kind of what sets us apart from everybody else. If you really want to get down to it, there's just one empty tomb. And there's just one way to be justified before God. And it's through the cross and it's through that empty tomb. It's through that man who died on the cross and bled on the cross for your sins. There's just one way to be saved. His name is Jesus. It's through the cross of Christ that we're redeemed. Sin is a problem. It's a problem for everybody. And if your sin has not been covered with the blood of Christ then it's still your sin and it's still your problem. And it's a big, big problem because that problem keeps you separated from God. But people don't want to deal with it and so they do with it what they think they should do with it. They do with it what everybody else is doing with it. They do with it what their parents did with it. They do with it what they see their neighbors doing with it. They do with it what they see actresses and actors and sports figures doing with it. They take their sin and they make an excuse for it. Or they take their sin and they justify it. Or they just take their sin and they sweep it under the rug and they ignore it and try to pretend like it's not there. Or they take their sin and they try to counteract it by being a good person and doing the right things and, and just being somebody who's good. Some of them will even try to claim that they're not sinners who are in need of a Savior at all, but there's a problem with that. 1 John talks about it, 1 John 1, 8 through 10. He says this, if we say we have no sin, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, he says we make him a liar and his word is not in us. In other words, if you think you're not a sinner, you're deceiving yourself. You're lying to yourself, and ultimately you are condemning yourself. You've got to understand and you've got to realize that every rebel needs a redeemer. In case there's any doubt, Paul said it like this in Romans 3.23, For all, all, every single one of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's our position. They are justified and only justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Earlier in Romans chapter 3 and verses 9 through 12, He said this, What then? Are we any better off? Because a lot of people say that. Well, I'm better off. I'm better off. I was raised in a Christian home. That don't mean you're going to heaven. I was raised in America. That don't mean you're going to heaven. I'm a good person. That doesn't mean you're going to heaven. It doesn't matter how good off you are. Paul says it right here, are we any better off? Not at all, for we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. It's the position we're all in. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. All alike become worthless. There is no one who does what is good, not even one. And every time I read that, I go, that kind of hurts. 
But it sure does make it crystal clear. It's a very clear perspective on our position. Praise God, there's a solution for sinners. Praise God, He didn't leave us without a solution. Praise God, there's a Redeemer for all rebels. His name is Jesus. Ephesians chapter 2 highlights it so well, what Isaiah predicted 700 years before Jesus was ever even born. Starting in verse 1 of Ephesians 2, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. He says, We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires. This is our position carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. And we were by nature children under wrath, as the others were also. But God, in verse 4, but God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love that he had for us, he did something. He made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in our trespasses. He says, you are saved by grace from that horrible position you were in as a rebel. And this is why I say every rebel needs a redeemer. You know what else we see here in this text? Point number three, we see the power of his punishment. The power that is in the punishment of Christ. He should not have been punished. He did not deserve to be punished. He had not earned his punishment. Even the thief on the cross. And can, you know, I, don't, I didn't know the thief I hadn't met the thief. The Bible doesn't say a whole lot about the thief. I'm going to bump into this guy one day in heaven and want to talk to him a little bit. I got some questions for him. This had to be a wild ride for him, right? But I'll tell you this. I do know this much about the thief on the cross. He was no spiritual theologian. He had not written any great books on theology. He, he did not have any great understanding. It doesn't appear, at least from what I can see, of the Old Testament or who Jesus would be or what the Messiah was. This guy knew nothing, but he figured it out. What does it say in Luke 23, 41 about this guy? He says, we are punished justly because we're getting back what we deserve for the things we did. He's telling this to the other thief. But this man, talking about Jesus who's dying there with them, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly, this is Jesus said, truly, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. That thief experienced the power of the punishment that Christ took for him. He didn't get off the cross. He didn't get to live another 10 years. But he still felt the power of the punishment of Christ as his sins were forgiven. You know, Jesus took the punishment for that thief. Just like he did for this thief. Just like he did for all you thieves. He took the punishment for him. Sometimes following Jesus means staying on the cross. Thief didn't get to come down, but he got to go to heaven. And this is what Isaiah is talking about in verse 5. But he was pierced because of our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him, and we are healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep. We've all turned to our own way, and the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. He was punished for our peace. He was punished for our iniquities. He was punished for my sins. He was punished for your sins. Paul says it so powerfully in Ephesians 2, 13 through 17. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Look at verse 14. For he is our peace who made both groups one and tore down the dividing wall of hostility. In his flesh he made of no effect the law consisting of commands and expressed in regulations so that he might create in himself one new man from the two. And what is the result? Peace. Resulting in peace. He did this so that he might reconcile both to God in one body through the cross by which he put the hostility to death he came and proclaimed the good news of peace to you who were far away and peace 
to those who were near. To the Colossians, he wrote this in Colossians 1, 19 through 20. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. It is through the punishment of Christ that we find the power of redemption for all rebels and the peace that all rebels seek. Every rebel needs a redeemer. There's no salvation apart from Christ. There's no forgiveness outside of Jesus. And there is no peace here on earth or there in eternity for anyone who refuses Christ and dies a rebel. There will be no peace. Every rebel needs a redeemer. And our last point for today is simply the privilege of his pardon. Oh, what a privilege it is to be pardoned by Jesus. To be pulled from the pit, the muck and the mire of our sin, to be washed clean. 700 years before he was born, Isaiah nailed it. He wrote it down. He staked everything that he was as a prophet on this. The fact that we can even be pardoned from our sins, the idea that we can be removed from the hopeless, worthless position we were in, in our sin, and we can have salvation through Jesus, what a privilege. The reality that we can be called sons and daughters of God, that he would adopt us into his family through the blood of Christ, what a privilege. Isaiah penned this in chapter 4. Chapter 53, excuse me, verse 6. The Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. Every rebel needs a redeemer. So God sent one. He sent his son to do the job that nobody else could do. The apostle Peter said it like this in 1 Peter 2, 24 and 25. He himself bore our sins in his body on that tree so that having died to sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were like sheep going astray, but you have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. We can only be saved by the blood of Jesus. It's the only way. There is no other name by which we can be saved. None. This privilege, this privilege of this pardon can only come from Jesus. Paul wrote it like this to the Romans in chapter 5, verse 6. For while we were still helpless... At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For rarely will someone die for an unjust, a just person, though for a good person, perhaps someone might even dare to die. But God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, while we were still rebels, Christ died for us. How much more then, since we have now been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from wrath? For if... While we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Then how much more, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life? And not only that, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received this reconciliation. Every rebel needs a redeemer. Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Let that sink in. He redeemed us by becoming a curse for us because it is written, cursed is everyone who's hung on a tree. That's what he did for you while you were still a rebel. 2 Corinthians 8.9, every rebel needs a redeemer. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. Might. Though he was rich, he had everything in heaven, walking on streets of gold, everybody's worshiping him, perfect place. He left all of that and come to this dirty old world. He wasn't born the son of a king or the prince of a big kingdom. He spent his first night in a manger, in a stable. He lived in poverty his whole life. He had nowhere to even lay his head. He slept on the couch in Peter's house most of the time. Guy had nothing. Everywhere he went, 
People were trying to trap him or trick him or test him or tease him, making fun of him. Everywhere he went, he got used. Hey, give us this, give us that, fix this, fix that. He would go away and try to just be alone with his father, and the crowds would come seek him out. And then as soon as they got what they wanted from him, they would abandon him and leave him. Spent most of his ministry trying to train those 12 knuckleheads. We call them the disciples. <laughs> it's just like, man, guy had some divine patience, that's for sure. And then at the end of it all, they abandon him while he's dying on the cross. He made himself poor so you might become rich. And I emphasize the might. Might. I keep telling you the truth when I say every rebel needs a redeemer, but here's the reality. Not every rebel will accept the redeemer. That's why it says might. Many will die in their sins. Many will die in their rebellion because they won't accept the Redeemer. I pray that will not be you. I pray that when the time comes and Jesus is separating the sheep from the goats, as it says in Scripture, I pray that you're going to be among God's people, not among the rebels. What pen are you going to be in? The goat pen or the sheep pen? Because it matters. Will you be counted among the rebels or will you be counted among the redeemed? What determines that is only this, if you accept the Redeemer as your Lord and Savior or not. Every rebel needs a Redeemer. And His name is Jesus. And His tomb is is empty. Let's pray. If you are here today or can hear my voice today and you are that rebel in need of a redeemer, we don't ask you to walk an aisle, to come to the front, to raise a hand, to stand up. This is between you and the Lord. All we ask you to do is what the Bible asks you to do, to repent of your sins and to confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If that's you, I want to encourage you to pray with me. This isn't a magic prayer. It's not a special prayer. It's not a prayer that's going to fix everything in your life, but it'll fix everything in your soul. Because if you pray it in faith, the Bible says you will be washed clean, your name will be written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and you will instantly be transformed from a rebel into a righteous son or daughter of God not of any work of your own, but of the work of the Redeemer, the work of the cross, the work that is manifested in an empty tomb. If that's you, pray with me. Say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a rebel. I'm a sinner. I've fallen short. I've gone astray. I've messed things up. And so I come before you this hour and I ask that you would change me, that you would fix me. I ask in faith that you would forgive me and wash me clean of all my sins. I thank you for your grace, for your goodness, for your love. I thank you for your, your passion for rebels like me your willingness to die on that tree for me. I give my life to you because you gave your life for me. Thank you. Lord, as we close this time, we thank you for what you've done. We thank you for what we celebrate here on Easter Day. Thank you that that tomb is empty. I've seen it with my eyes. Lord, we thank you that you were willing to make yourself poor so we could be rich. We thank you for the privilege of that pardon that makes us sons and daughters of God despite our pathetic position in our sin. 
and thank you for all that you do for rebels like us. Thank you for making us your righteous sons and daughters. May we live like it. May we be your hands and feet. May we boldly proclaim the gospel wherever we go. May people see it in our lives before we even speak with our mouths. Lord, we ask and we pray this now in Jesus' name.